Good day, leaders. This is Michelle, the creator and host of the MCP PhD video podcast, where I discuss leadership and organizational change with everyday leaders. And today's guest is Nicole Freeman. So viewers, let me read a quick little bio on Nicole so you can get to know her as well. Nicole is originally from London in the UK. She lives only a few miles up the road now from where she grew up. She is trained as a chartered accountant, I guess, in the United States. That's a CPA, Nicole. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, she has her MBA and she's worked for one of the top four professional service firms, which was Anderson until the Enron collapse, alongside taking a career break to be with her kids. She then did some consulting, including one for UK's top business schools. She helped run a family business and set up her own award-winning kids cooking school, being featured on Sky before retraining as a rapid transformational therapist. With regard to leadership and organizational change, her experience has been both as a leader, coach, and mentor throughout all her career and in her current role, working with leaders to shift subconscious blocks that are holding them back and keeping them playing small. In particular, her focus is a lot on anxiety and visibility issues, which is perfect for today's topic. Thank you so much, Nicole, for being here. Thank um, you for having me. Absolutely. So viewers, what we're going to do today is a Q&A session with Nicole off the cuff. We're going to answer three questions on the topic today of anxiety and visibility, which you might think aren't we talking about leadership and organizational change? Why would we be talking about anxiety and visibility? Yes, it's true. Leaders can experience issues with anxiety and visibility. The first question is, what do I do if I become anxious around my boss and or other authority figures? Okay. What comes up for you when you think about this? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, so I always like to start out by explaining, I think, what anxiety is, because particularly as leaders, we tend to think, oh, nobody suffers with that. <clears throat> we can't have that. That's not something they would, that would be an issue. And it's basically kind of, if you look at a dictionary definition, it's a feeling of kind of worry, nervousness, maybe some unease about something that's got an uncertain future. So it's really our desire to want to control it. And of course, when we're dealing with our boss or our leader, we can't really control it. We're not in that sort of position. And I want to say also, it's a hardwired response to keep us safe. So like from prehistoric times, anxiety was good because we'd be out fighting and we'd have this saber tooth tiger and our brains haven't really moved on. So our boss hopefully is not quite so scary, but our brain doesn't know that. It has the same kind of physical reaction. Anxiety, I think, is to do with our feeling that we're out of control. And what I want to suggest, particularly in a time like now, where a lot of things feel out of control, we don't feel in control of our lives. The only thing we can control is our mind. Um, and so really getting inside and understanding your subconscious brain is, is the answer to how you can deal with that. So the first thing I, I always say to people is no one was born afraid. Um, in other words, it's a learned response. So if we look at babies, for example, you know, nobody, you know, you wouldn't find a baby saying, oh my God, I don't know how to stand up. I don't know how to eat. I better not try. You know, I've fallen over. I better not do it again. We just keep going and we have that inner self-belief. We're just not worried. We just believe that we can do it. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is kind of tap back into that. Because once we realize that effectively anxiety is like a learned behavior, we can unlearn it. Um, so realize that we're the same as everybody else. So that would be my first kind of tip on that. And then the other thing, as I said to you, anxiety always has a physical manifestation. That can be different for all of us. It could be, you know, sweaty palms. It could be, you know, getting flushed in the face. It could be stuttering over your words, whatever that is. Um, but we can choose to reframe that because the physical sensation is the same as for excitement. So, you know, I could say, oh my God, I'm so anxious about speaking today. And, and then, you know, I have a completely different perception and my actions are going to, you know, follow on from that thought and that belief. But I could say, wow, I'm so excited to talk to Michelle today. What a great opportunity. And that completely shifts, you know, where I'm coming from. And right. so that would be how I would approach that. So to say, wow, this is my opportunity to shine in front of my boss. My boss wants to hear what I've got to say. This is my chance for promotion rather than, oh, my God, I'm going to come across like an idiot I've got nothing interesting to say I'm going to be fired you know whatever those kind of things are that the thoughts negative thoughts that are playing in your head um 
So the reframing is really important. And then also some of two questions that I always like to give people to ask. So one is whatever the anxious situation is, what is the worst that can happen? So, you know, if you're anxious around you, what is the worst? So, you know, you might stumble over your words or something. Nothing terrible is going to happen. Um, and the second one is to keep asking the, the question, why? Why am I anxious? So not just to, you know, why am I worried? And just have a simple answer like, well, I'm worried about my boss. Yeah. You know, what am I worried about? Am I worried that I'm going to fluff my words? Okay, why am I worried about that? You know, what evidence have I got? And you keep going until you really kind of get to that root cause of what is making you anxious. Because when you can work that out, then you can deal with it. I love this discussion already, Nicole. I love what you said with regard to first understanding and maybe even having compassion, right? For the fact that if you do get triggered with anxiety in a leadership role, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not weak. You're not, yeah. uh, you're not an abnormal, actually no. it's a normal response. Um, and, and understanding that perhaps that feeling of being in a lack of, that lack of control um, it may trigger a part of your brain, maybe from, from childhood. I had a previous boss who confided in me saying that oh, his father was uh, very verbally abusive. Mm -hmm. And when he was in a certain meetings with a certain authority figure that seemed to be just like his dad, he felt like he was 10 years old all over That's again, amazing. even though... He was an executive leader, reframing. So, so let me ask you a little bit about reframing because you did say um, that we have the ability to change the context of an interaction that maybe would get us historically anxious, but we can reframe it. How? Um, do you suggest um, affirmations? Do you suggest, I know you're an RTT, um, therapist energy work. Um, any strategies for the reframing part? I think any of those work. It depends really on the individual. So for some people, affirmations are brilliant. For others, visualizations, you know, seeing the outcome of that meeting is really successful, whatever those things are. But I think you can, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to, to think about is this, this concept of looping thoughts so that you have a kind of thought in your mind. So it might be like, I'm really worried about this meeting. And that leads to a belief. And what's the belief, you know? Um, I'm an idiot, I'm going to fluff up in the meeting, I'm going to probably get fired. And then that creates a kind of change. So then what happens is the, what are the action? If you really believe that you're going to be rubbish in, yeah. in this meeting, you're probably not going to speak up because you're worried you're going to fluff your lines. And then what happens when you don't speak up is your boss doesn't see your participation and your involvement. And then the event from that is maybe you don't get that promotion. Then what happens when you don't get the promotion, it feeds back into that loop. Oh, I didn't get promoted. See, that's because I'm an idiot and I fluffed my lines. Right. So at any point in that cycle, you can choose to reframe it. So for some people, the simplest way is the physical sensation. Because when we are really anxious, we tend to like hold our stress here in our shoulders. So I always say like, roll your shoulders back. Um, and as you've probably seen when you watch TV and you watch politicians, you know, they're always swallowing here. You're always seeing it when they're gulping <laughs> from a drink because our mouth gets really dry when we're nervous. And so what you can do is either have a drink or it sounds really weird, but kind of swill the saliva in your mouth just so that your mouth is wet and your shoulders are down. And then you're sending that signal back to your brain, which is like, oh, mouth wet, shoulders down. This, she must be quite relaxed. So it's okay. And then everything flows much more easily. Um, so I think at any point in that cycle, so for some people, it's visualizing the end goal. For some yeah. people, it'll be affirmations saying, I'm, I'm capable, I'm in control, I'm relaxed, all of those positive words. Um, for other people, you know, it just, I think if you just reframe it as excitement, that often works for a lot of people because when they understand it's the same physical sensation, it's just how you choose to see it. Oh, um, yeah, I love that. Um, because, you know, as leaders, sometimes we need to have difficult conversations with our bosses. You know, yeah. maybe if you are in charge of a particular division and your division didn't perform well, that's a difficult conversation to have with your boss. And you can have anxiety in that, in that moment. Um, so maybe the nature, the context of the conversation can bring anxiety. The actual person themselves can trigger anxiety. Um, and even just workload itself, you know, leaders often have a lot of pressure and responsibility. 
And if they themselves feel like they are not meeting expectations or they, they're, they're up to their eyeballs, can bring about anxiety. So there's a lot of room for leaders to become anxious at times around authority figures when they feel like maybe um, they're not good enough. I think maybe, maybe yes. the central belief might be that they're not good enough. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, I was gonna come back to it. I think imposter syndrome is really key here. What you said about compassion and particularly the example you gave, I think is really important because as children, we all have that, you know, that's where most of our beliefs are shaped. And, you know, as we start to kind of be independent, you know, even as young as two, we're told, you know, we have that terrible twos, you probably have that same phrase that states. Um, you know, what happens is our parents kind of slap down on us, any authority figures, no, sit there, do that, don't behave like that. And we learn to, you know, we're not as children, we can't answer back. And so that example that you said was so powerful, because I think that's often what happens when you have to have those difficult conversations, you know, and, and often there is a reason, you know, if your boss is giving you a hard time and saying, well, those figures are not what I expected, you should be able to kind of come back and explain and justify. And sometimes it's battling against that kind of belief that you know resistance to authority um but i do think also it's really important that we have more open conversations but actually everybody feels like this and it's natural because i think the other thing that plays for a lot of people in their mind is well i'm a leader now and i shouldn't be feeling like this and if i'm feeling like this then there's something wrong with me and i'm not very good at my job and and that just sets off again that kind of you know vicious cycle really i agree and i would say leaders watching if you have direct reports especially if you have leaders who are direct reports you know keep in mind that you may unintentionally trigger your leaders your direct reports to be anxious so be mindful on how you approach you that that really brought up something that you said for me too was that um, how, what can you say and what can you do as a leader to make your team feel comfortable to tell you bad news, to really yeah. ultimately to tell you anything? So, so that's, an important, that's an important note there too on the other end. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's, you know, you're, you're right. You can create a kind of open door culture and there are lots of things you can say, but actually like that phrase says, you know, actions speak louder than words. Yeah. So often it is, you know, how you've responded and not necessarily how that particular boss has responded to you, but how other people have responded to you conditions the way you feel, because although most of our, you know, belief system is enshrined from childhood, you know, we're not leaders in childhood, are we? Um, and so these are the things that we learn kind of going through life. And, you know, when people talk about having amazing mentors, that's using that for the good. But equally, if we've had bad experiences, then that can condition and make us feel more anxious when we're, like you said, having these difficult conversations. Because all, all it is, is basically our responses are a, um, our reaction or our interpretation of an event. So if, for example, like as a, I said, as a child, as a, or like the example that you gave me, you know, somebody's been in a position of an authority figure and as a 10 year old that was your response that was an appropriate response as a 10 year old like oh my god I better not say anything I better not do anything I'm in trouble but you know when you're 45 you know you're not that 10 year old anymore and you can stand up for yourself but our brains haven't moved on because it's like running on old software so yeah. when you kind of what I do is in a hypnosis session you go back and you'd identify that belief and obviously you you know you're you're um, mentor your colleague knew that belief but often people don't know they don't know where that belief stems from mm. um, and I can give you some examples about you know typical kind of scenarios and, and that sort of authority issue is absolutely a typical scenario yeah. um, but then when you go back and you realize that, that kind of light bulb moment comes you're like oh I get that and that's why I don't like answering people back or I think it's answering people back but it's not I don't stand up for myself but you can see it's no longer appropriate and that's when you can kind of break that behavior and then give yourself a new one. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why affirmations work really well, because essentially what you're doing is you're giving your brain a kind of goal to work towards. Your brain doesn't know whether it's right or wrong or good or bad. You know, if you tell yourself you're anxious, you're anxious. If you tell yourself you're excited, you're excited. And, you know, so that's, you're just giving yourself a kind of a new manual, really. Um, that's, that's really hopeful. I think that creates a lot of hope and promise. Um, and that's really encouraging, I think, so that you don't have this feeling of helplessness if you're in a situation, yeah. So, uh, so, what, so reframe, uh, visualize, um, affirmations, uh, try to get to the root and ask yourself, why yeah. do I feel this way? And maybe yeah. do some, uh, some inner work. Uh, no yeah. maybes about it. Do some inner work <laughs> um, to, um, 
yeah, and create new evidence for yourself and really, you know, think about what, what would your day look like if you woke up every single day and you truly felt, you know, I am good enough and I'm doing my best. And those affirmations would still hold true. You know, you'd still be able to say after a difficult conversation, I did my best, I delivered it really well, I stayed calm, you know, all of those things. So I think looking for the good because our brains are hardwired. We're hardwired to, you know, move towards pleasure and move away from pain, you know, that saber tooth tiger. So if we're if we're seeing something as really anxiety provoking, we're not going to do it again. And then again, our brain's like, what's familiar? We go for the easy wins. And so we have to make it familiar sometimes. And that can be a painful or maybe slightly painful first step. And then the more we repeat it, the more it becomes a habit, the easier it gets. And you know, the easier it gets, the more you do it. So um, there's a virtuous cycle there too. I love that. Let's talk about visibility. Let's talk about Mm -hmm. the second question here, which is, what's holding me back from being visible? And first I wanted to ask you, what do you mean by visible? Mm, So many different answers to this. That's why I love it. So it's different things for different people. So I'll give you some examples because I think that always really resonates and then people can see themselves in that. So it could be, um, particularly for now, for example, missing out on opportunities, you know, so maybe you've got a particular business or your job's in a particular area, but it's not working the way it's normally done. And, you know, you, you don't want to be visible. So you don't want to put yourself out there. You don't want to pivot. You don't want to do something different. So you could be missing out. Um, it could be that you just, you, you are worried about um, putting yourself out there because maybe you lack that self-belief. So you're undercharging for services or maybe you're not, you know, winning as many clients, or you're not kind of closing those deals, you know, you don't want to really be out there and put yourself out there. Mm. So it could have a financial impact as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And like you said, as well, you know, maybe you're not being your authentic self, maybe you think you have to be somebody else. So actually, although you are being visible, you're not really you because you're not really being visible as you should be. And and therefore, that's kind of, you know, you you lack congruence, and it's not going to end well. Um, some people really lack the self-belief so they don't get out there because they're always chasing that next certification or accreditation, you know, Oh, well, I, you know, I can't put myself out there as leader or I won't put myself up for the promotion because I don't have that qualification or I need to do that course or I need to be in the job for five years before Mm -hmm. I can do that. You know, all of these procrastination perhaps um, sort of excuses. So there's that. Um, there's all kinds of things really I mean I particularly now I think we're social media and, and now where we are you know obviously everybody's online like this the whole time and if someone is a current leader in an organization um, you know maybe they are ahead of a team and department um, and they want to stay within their department but they don't want to be as visible to other areas and network with other uh, functions of, of an organization maybe that could apply there too yeah uh, just basically staying in a, in a perceivably safe. safe, small, right. Yeah. Safe, it's you're playing safe and you're playing small. So you're not getting yourself out there for that promotion or the networking or whatever it is. And, and that can show up in all kinds of, you know, socially as well. So if you're the kind of person that goes to a party and then kind of stays in the back and talks to the two or three people, you know, you're right. not getting out there. You're not being visible as well. Right. Um, and it and often comes back. Say, oh, I was going to say, but that's not to say that someone can't, they don't have to be extroverted all the time. No, They can be themselves, you know, and, and be introverted if you're introverted. Yeah. Right? And yeah, absolutely. I don't mean you have to be the life and soul of the party, but um, <laughs> it is, it is feeling comfortable. I think all of this stuff is feeling comfortable in who you are and, and what you're about and what you have to offer personally and professionally um, and wanting people to know who you are and what you can do and how you can help them really. I mean, that's, you know, the core of kind of what any business is, whether you're working for yourself or you're in an organization, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you could be an introvert at work, but if you're a kind of backroom boy and nobody knows who you are and you don't have lunch with anybody or you don't talk to anybody or, you know, no one knows of your existence, you never will be promoted and you won't maybe work as effectively, like you said, because you're not working across departments or, you know, with other individuals. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you know, what do you think are some of the reasons why leaders are held back from being visible in these different areas? Mm. It's usually two things. So usually I, fear, I find that it's um, a fear of failure. Um, so they're worried, you know, I don't want to 
put myself out there. I don't want to do that meeting. Well, as we were talking before, you know, I don't want to take that leadership role. What if I fail? What if I'm no good? What if everybody laughs? And it's that basically what that is, a fear of failure is exactly what I just said. It's a fear of being judged and being judged by other people. So the, the answer, the cure, if you like, for that one is to really to think and to believe that it's only you that can judge yourself. You know, actually, in some sense, what other people say doesn't matter. And I know that seems really difficult in a leadership um, environment where you've got a boss and, you know, your livelihood does depend on what somebody else thinks. But you have to kind of be true to yourself and you have because otherwise that fear is going to be holding you back that anxiety is not helpful. So you've got to be saying, like you said before, with those affirmations, you know, I've done my best. I, you know, I'm, do, I'm doing my best. I can only do this. I'm going to do it to the best of my abilities and, and I'm not going to worry about it. Um, mm. So I think, I think it's that. Um, and then of course the other fear is, is getting outside your comfort zone. So for people that don't like, you know, being on zoom, it's because it's a new thing or, um, and I think particularly, you know, as you get, further up that pyramid it is harder to share your anxieties with others isn't it and be really truly honest about that because you're opening yourself up to be vulnerable and usually we don't see vulnerability as a strength we see it as a weakness um so i think you know realizing that that is important i mean you know kind of in my time when i was in corporate i don't think anybody ever discussed imposter syndrome and that would have saved me a huge amount of you know, years of self-help, um, because actually if you realize that everybody else is in the same and it's perfectly natural, you're not beating yourself up about it. Because when you're beating yourself up and you're like, well, everybody else is an amazing leader, aren't they? Everybody else can give a presentation. Everybody else puts themselves up for that promotion. Yeah. It's only me. It just, it's chipping away. It's that negative chatter. And it just means ultimately, like I, I said, with that looping thought, you're not going to deliver as well. You're not being your true authentic self and you're not realizing your potential mm -hmm. um, and that is the bit that holds you back um yeah wow so much to unpack there <laughs> because, <laughs> um you know i think it also has to do you know you talk about the pyramid of of when you rise uh, higher and higher on the, on, the, on the corporate ladder let's say that there can be a belief that it's lonely at the top mm -hmm. and that actually is a belief that if you believe it, it will be true. But if you don't believe it, it doesn't have to be true. If you form uh, friendships and other relationships with other leaders to be able to learn from one another, mentor one another, confide in one another, support one another, uh, advocate for and with one another, it uh, doesn't have to be lonely at the top. What about, uh, it, it brought up also the, the, fear, of, uh, the fear of success. Yeah. And which, that is the flip which side. I'm sure yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, because, um, you know, what comes up for me with for fear of failure is um, sometimes there's that uh, fear of trying to always make the perfect impression, always the perfect presentation to influence change, always the perfect speech to your direct reports to inspire them, always the perfect, you know, and, and uh, I think it's such a, such a, um, uh, relief to know that if you make a bad impression one day because you're cranky and you didn't get enough sleep and you didn't have lunch between meetings and you just had a bag of whatever snack and you're hungry yeah. and your stomach is growling and you're not on your A game but you showed up and you did your best for what you could at the time that that was actually good enough yeah yeah and sometimes think, you know it's it's not perfect and actually it rarely ever is I don't think as, as a, what I like to say, a recovering perfectionist, um, you know, perfection, I think, yeah, because as you get higher up in that pyramid, you know, everybody is looking at you and, and everybody, we tend to take it on ourselves like, oh, well, I must be more special than the next person. I've got to be perfect. And, and it's very typical that leaders have a kind of tendency towards perfectionism, but actually perfectionists are some of the unhappiest people because it's like, running a race where you're constantly moving the finishing line oh, because absolutely. if you're aiming for 100 percent, 99 is never going to be good enough and so you're never going to be happy with yourself and so yeah. you're always chipping away so i think it's really important to try and let go that you know sort of done is better than perfect i i didn't think that i was a perfectionist because in some areas i wasn't so for example if someone says michelle we've got a meeting in five minutes let's whip up something it doesn't have to be perfect. Let's go. Let's run with it. But in other areas, I was uh, and and still mindful that I can fall into the trap of perfectionism 
because I used to, I used to think, well, when I make that impression, again, it goes back to those beliefs. Some kind of those things that we hear in culture a lot is you can't, uh, people judge you within the first 10 seconds. You can't um, replace a first impression or however. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would challenge that. I have made plenty of bad first impressions. The second impression sometimes is way better than the first impression, you know? You but that's your understand. perception as well. So I think that's yeah. the really important thing. Like when I say not being judged, I always say we're so harsh on ourselves, all of us, but particularly perfectionists. Be kind to yourself and, and think, yeah. you know, even if you think you made a really bad first impression, it probably wasn't that bad that the other people thought, my God, right. terrible. I never want to see them again. So it's, it's putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, I think, could be also a really good tool for yeah. managing that anxiety that you feel. Yes. Yeah. And then with regard to fear of success, I think it has um, a lot to do with, you know, I'm currently reading a book right now. Um, I think it's by, uh, I'm a, uh-oh. Oh, no. It'll come back to you. <laughs> It'll come back to me. Uh, okay. Called the, uh, the Big Leap. And, oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's, you know, for anyone who hasn't read it, you know, I definitely recommend the book. It's uh, how to leap out of your zone of excellence to your zone of genius. It's do I deserve success? Hmm. How much happiness am I willing to accept in my life? See, most because I'm in the UK and I think it's a cultural thing, um, there's more, I see more probably fear of failure than fear of success. I think that might be more of an American thing, which I think is great. Um, well, more because I think the, the, the sense generally culturally is that, you know, you're unlimited, you have much more potential. I think we tend to sort of dampen it down here. Um, but yeah, again, it can often come back to childhood, the feeling that, you know, you're not worthy, who am I to deserve the success, yeah. particularly because often it comes with financial success. And so people can have money blocks about that, you know, people that are rich and successful are not nice people, or, exactly. you know, maybe you feel like you, you shouldn't be more successful than your parents, or there can be all kinds of things. So yeah, you do, you're playing small again, you're, you're still successful, but you're not reaching kind of your full potential because you're holding yourself back. Because you could have a sibling, and if you feel like you're outshining your sibling, that that could subconsciously be holding you back. So yeah. all, all sorts of different things. Yeah. 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 So let's go to the third question, which mm -hmm. is, what do I do if I become anxious during a webcam meeting? And I love this question because, you know, we are in May uh, 2020. We are still in quarantine for COVID-19, a lot more virtual meetings. It is not a natural phenomenon. Like right now I'm talking to Nicole and I could see my face. Yes. <laughs> and then they're in a webcam meeting and they feel anxious because maybe they are picking apart their hair and their, you know, face. You know, what comes up, what, what can a leader do? What, you know, what, what strategies, if any, are there that leaders can, uh, can take to help with that? Mm, that's a great question. I mean, I think some of it is what we talked about before, because I think you're right, that the immediate thing that you see is you looking at yourself in the mirror, which for most people isn't very comfortable. Um, and I have had a lot of clients in the past that are, you know, for example, won't, don't want photos on websites because they've got issues about, you know, Photography, and this is the same kind of thing as we're looking at. Basically, what it is is you don't like looking at yourself. Um, you don't like looking at yourself on the camera or on the still, and this is kind of the, the worst of both worlds. And you have your home backgrounds as well. So there's a, I think that there's, you know, normally we have that professional relationship, don't we? We see each other in the office, but nobody, we don't let people into our private homes and our private spaces. Okay. So there's a lot of practical things you can do to kind of, you know, put screens behind it or just make it a bit more innocuous, not so messy, not so personal. Um, and for some people that that is a lot of it, what it is, I think particularly for leaders, you don't necessarily want everybody going, oh my God, look at your room and I can see you've got that bit of furniture there, et cetera, et cetera. Which <laughs> um, seems like a small concern, but actually if that's what's making you anxious, then there are some really practical tips and techniques that point. That you can mm. do. Um, but I think like we said before, it is, it's an unnatural situation. So to realize that it is unnatural and that everybody else feels the same is quite helpful because one of the things that makes us all more anxious and starts to trigger those feelings of imposter syndrome is thinking it's only me. It's only me that worries about being on Zoom. And actually that's not true. So yeah. we kind of, we try, aren't we really, we want to feel connected. And by realizing that we're all equally anxious, that in a weird way makes us feel more connected, makes us feel a bit safer. Um, 
but yeah, I, I think it, again, it's making it familiar. I think now, you know, if you compare ourselves back to say seven weeks ago, what I said, you know, we're all doing this all the time now. It's probably got more familiar. You're probably less anxious than you were seven weeks ago. And realizing that shows you how much kind of how far you can come and how yeah. you repetition is so, so helpful. Well, and that's a good point with repetition. So I started my podcast in uh, March, so just a couple months ago. My very first video podcast, I was pretty nervous. I was excited, but I was pretty nervous mm -hmm. because I hadn't done it before. Okay. And advice that, you know, I have is, you know, don't look at yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I'm, if I'm talking to you, Nicole, I should look at you and respond naturally to you as opposed to staring at myself and how I should be responding. So, you know, just cut that out. Um, and it is kind of weird uh, to have like a little camera up here and then that's not a person. And sometimes you have to talk to a non-person to be able to make eye contact. And that is a, a different thing. But like you said, everyone's going through it. And um, one thing that I did was um, I drew, I thought of uh, one of my uh, girlfriends who I'm really um, just comfortable around. And, and I'm, I just, we laugh and we have a good time. And I put her, I drew a stick figure of her and put her name on the post-it and I just stuck it up next to my camera. And I think subconsciously, I just think that, oh, well then I'm going to bond and connect like with everyone else, just like I do with my friend and anyone who's watching me is my friend and I'm friends with anyone that I'm talking to. So, um, so there are little like sneaky little strategies that you could do if you, you know, if you're new to webcaming, because I was, it was, it's a new, it's yeah. a new thing. Or I think when you've got a bigger meeting, you know, maybe take yourself off the screen so that you're less tempted to look at yourself and worry if that's what's making you yeah, anxious and the whole you can focus on everybody up. else and what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And yeah. also too, I yeah. mean, um, I, I practice, uh, so I know you're into, you are an, an, um, a rapid transform, transformational therapist. Um, could I ask you to explain quickly what that is? I'm interested in uh, energy healing techniques. I, I, I use EFT uh, tapping. Yeah. For those who don't know what that is, I'll include a link on the bottom. You probably think I'm crazy right now. But by, um, but by using different, um, using, basically using our energy system to clear beliefs, it's pretty powerful. Uh, what is rapid transformation therapy? Okay, so the short answer is, um, it kind of does what it says on the tin. So it's, it's therapy that helps shift your limiting beliefs, but that's rapid. So it's not like traditional therapy where, you know, you're going for weeks and years and, you know, at the same time, it's like one to three sessions. So it's really rapid. It is really transformational because you're going back and you're understanding the limiting beliefs um, and then reframing them. So, I mean, anxiety is always a great example. So, you know, public speaking, for example, which is essentially what we're doing now. I mean, you know, webcams, meetings, it's all public yeah. speaking. Um, I think we tend to think it's like me on a stage with a thousand people, but it's effectively you speaking and people looking at you um, and you worrying about how you come across, what you say, etc. But that's the number yeah. one fear. So it's very, very common. Um, but yeah, I think... Um, Things like that, for example, you know, you could say, I'm, I just know that I'm going to have to practice it. It's the thousand hour rule. I'm going to go to there's lots of speaker bureaus. I'm going to do that. And you will get better at it. And mm -hmm. your anxiety will probably diminish. But if there was a, a root cause going back to your childhood, let's say, you know, like in your example, you got on stage at school when you were five and everybody laughed and the teacher said, oh, my God, that was terrible and was totally inappropriate. You would have. What was the belief that you made? Oh, my God, I'm terrible. And you know, everybody laughed at me and that made me feel awful. And so your brain is keeping you safe. So your brain's like, I'm not going there. I don't anymore. want to do this. Exactly. Yeah. So you're not going to be in the school plays, you know, and it becomes more and more unfamiliar. And then of course, then as, as an adult in a leadership role, you know, when you're called to do that, what is triggered is that belief, just like you said before, but your brain doesn't get that, you know, that was an appropriate response for a child, but not now. So that's really what we do in a session. So the technical answer to it is it's a mix of kind of, psychotherapy, um, some neuro-linguistic programming, which is some of what you said about affirmations and really understanding the way the brain works and also cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's some of those questions I was asking you like about the why. So you can really try and be logical with yourself. So when you have what seems an irrational fear, like I don't want to do this, I'm really anxious with my boss, is to say, you know, let's ask some questions. You know, what is the worst case outcome? What am I worried about? 
How can I stop it happening? Mm. Do I have evidence that that's a genuine fear? You know, what, what's happened in the past? You know, because again, then we can use on those. Well, actually, I've, you know, I've been promoted. Look at me. I've been doing really well. I manage a team. I've always managed a team really well. So there's no reason I shouldn't do it in my new job or whatever the situation is. Um, and then also looking at the benefits, the costs and benefits sometimes can be really helpful. So it, it's a mix of sort of all of those. Um, okay. But usually so, you can get a real light bulb moment in a, in a session, which is really powerful. So if you are a leader watching I would, and you have a presentation that's in three weeks from now, I would probably say it's not a good thing to say, well, I have to hurry up and get all this emotional healing so that when I present, I will have effortless social confidence and it will be great because I don't think the mind necessarily works that way. I don't think we can say, well, then I have a deadline. So then therefore, but at the same time, I think that uh, to your point, there's a lot of value of starting that journey to kind of go backwards. Um, and there's a lot of modalities uh, to, to explore. RTT is a great one. EFT, there's other, there's other, other yeah. ones. You see, look, look into it. Um, I, I would recommend. Um, I know with EFT, Nicole, that there are different tapping points on the body. And some of the tapping points are like the liver point. Yeah. So right now I'm tapping on the liver point. You can't see. I'm on camera. Yeah. Or there's finger points. And then literally, you don't have to believe in it. You don't have to think, oh, Michelle, I'm never going to watch your podcast again because now she's talking to Nicole <laughs> about tapping and you know, hypnosis and, and uh, neuro-linguistic programming, and they're all nutcases. That's fine. Um, but look into it because they're, they're really some powerful techniques. But I at least know with EFT that there are just, just by simply stimulating certain points on the body, you can probably do them off camera and no one would even know. And it just releases um, the positive, happy hormones as opposed to, uh, you know, the stress hormone cortisol that can invade your body when you're anxious. So um, yeah. there are probably some yeah. techniques that you could probably look into off camera in the now. And then, like you said, invest the time in the inner work that as you edge toward um, uh, more speaking engagements, it's not that you necessarily become this like superhero person that's so perfect and effortless. It's just you just don't get triggered. Uh, that's all that's all really social ease really is right is that you just can relax yeah because we're, we're all born that way so what you're trying to do is tap back into to release you know tapping i think is great it's very complimentary um but you're trying to tap back into that belief and what i would say to people is you know i think you and i both understand that having come from kind of quite a corporate and logical analytical background that what some people would describe as the kind of woo woo sort of culture yeah. seems a bit uncomfortable um, and I, I don't mean that with any disrespect, but I would not categorize myself in that kind of thing either. But I think, you know, if we if we look, for example, to medicine, where we think about things like the placebo effect, that I think right. you know, is scientifically proven, we all understand it, we would all accept it. That is basically the power of the mind. Yeah. So if you believe that the power of the mind can do those kind of things, and, you know, there's all kinds of examples of, you know, spontaneous um, healing and, you know, things that are not explained by medical science, and, and you can read books by doctors not you know mm -hmm. um anything that you wouldn't believe in if you can believe in that then i think that's a really good i always think it's a good window into understanding that actually there is so much potential in your subconscious to help reprogram your mind however you do that whether that is tapping or affirmations or visualizations or manifesting or any of those things whatever works for you mm -hmm. um but it is definitely possible and, and as a general rule kind of you know three to four weeks of constant stuff is is what it takes to reprogram your mind so it's not a you know you could have had a problem for 50 or 60 years but actually it's something that in the relatively short term you can yeah. definitely help I, I i my hope is that by having this conversation which for some may be unconventional so i'm sorry viewers if you fall into that category but um but my hope is that this brings hope to um you know aspiring leaders and current leaders who uh experience anxiety related to different social interactions being visible showing up maybe expanding your influence out into the world uh, and then also in the digital age, uh, presenting yourself and communicating over the webcam. Sometimes what's good is to, to look at or to talk to others that have 
done something that's helped them get over that because Absolutely. I think we can all always resonate more when we hear case studies and we're like oh god that really works and yeah I remember so and so was really had a fear of public speaking or didn't like doing this and now I can see a month later they're so much better because exactly. that actually is what you need is you need to believe none of these techniques will work if you don't believe in them I think that's really important to say so if you're stuck in that thing if you're um, it's called secondary gain. So if you have this belief that actually, you know, being anxious is serving you a purpose. So if you don't want to go for that promotion or you don't want to do something and you're telling yourself these stories that I'm not good and I can't because I'm not capable, yep. there's something holding you back. So it's until you actually want to make that change, oh, sure. there's no point. So, But yeah, that's a really excellent point that the nocebo effect is just as powerful as the placebo effect. That if you yeah. truly believe that something will not work for you, no matter what, it won't. Yeah, but there's hope. So anyways, um, so beautiful. Thank you for this discussion today, Nicole. Before you leave us, could you uh, share two things with us? Could you please share a resource that could help uh, viewers, leaders watching on their journey to uh, successful leadership and organizational change in the 21st century? And then also, could you please leave us with one of your favorite inspirational quotes? So the resource I'm going to share with you, um, which I know you're going to put um, in the comments below, is um, just a general overview of what anxiety is. Because I think often we don't focus on it and we don't understand that some of these things are making us anxious and acceptance is the first step in you know trying to come to, to terms with that and then there's some great links in there to various techniques whether that's cbt or something else so i thought that that would be kind of helpful um, and also so you can recognize the symptoms um, and then the quote which i picked for anxiety was really nice i'm just going to read it it's a really old quote from from the philosopher marcus aurelius and it says, today I escaped anxiety, or no, I discarded it, because it was within me, in my own perceptions, and not outside. And I just really like that, because I think that we tend to have this belief, and when you, when you read the, the um, resource that I've given you, there's a lot of evidence that makes people think that um, there's a genetic predisposition towards anxiety. You know, oh, well, I'm going to be anxious because my mom was, or that depression runs in the family, or I can't cope, nobody in my, my family was successful in business, or whatever those things are. And actually, there's a huge body of scientific evidence to suggest that that's not the case, um, particularly in the medical realm. So, you know, if you can buy into that, then I think you can buy into this idea, is what I wanted to say to you, that it actually is inside, and, and it is to do with really working on your mindset um, and helping you make the progress that you want to. Totally. Beautiful, Nicole. Thank you so much. You know, it boils down to we only have so much time on this planet. I think it's a universal desire to experience peace and um, joy and, um, oh, and happiness and contentment. And that's a hard, these are hard things to experience when you're feeling anxious. And when you're in a leadership role, you have added responsibilities, you have added visibility. These types of challenges can be you know, difficult for some leaders. I would say for many leaders, maybe not in all social contexts, but maybe sometimes in some. Maybe it's giving a presentation, maybe it's a webcam talk, maybe it's having a difficult conversation with a direct report who's a strong personality. Maybe it's um, talking to your boss uh, about something that's difficult and you feel anxious about it. Um, maybe it's having a group meeting. Maybe it's speaking on a conference call. Um, maybe it's something else. I don't know. Um, but whatever it is, as leaders, more uh, responsibility is placed on us to be able to communicate more frequently. And sometimes that can bring anxiety. And hopefully this conversation brought, uh, thank you so much. It brought so many um, different layers to, diff uh, to approach it from a place of um, understanding, questioning, um, some inner work and different strategies that you can take to try to get to the root of it so that you actually can kind of break free of feeling that way. And kind of, you know, you can handle any situation the best when you're calm and relaxed. So it's so wonderful if you can get to that state. So, well, I love that you said those two words, because actually one thing I wanted to say as a little tip just to leave you with is language is so powerful. 
because, and that's the reason affirmations when they're done well work so well, because our brain responds to kind of the words of the pictures. So even saying, I'm not anxious for this meeting, the, the brain does not realize the word not, all it's hearing is anxious. So just lose that word. Hearing so it. say to yourself, I'm calm and relaxed. That's what I like to say. Yeah. So some, some words naturally have an opposite. So if you could say, you know, people that say, I don't know, I'm an insomniac, you know, you, you don't say I'm not, I don't wake up in the middle of the night. You'd say I sleep all the way through. It's I kind of an obvious up. one, but calm and relaxed, I think is, is really nice. So if you can just keep saying to yourself, I'm calm and relaxed, I can cope, I've got this, whatever those things are that for you. Um, so lose the word anxious. I love that. <laughs> yes. Thank you for bringing that into that context. I appreciate that because uh, viewers take this information and think about it, process it, think about how this impacts you. And if this doesn't impact you and you're in a leadership role, think about how it could impact your direct reports. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation today. I know we did. And between now and the next video, think about how you can use these principles on your journey in leadership and organizational change.